we're uh, here. We had a slight change in our program. Uh, we'd like to thank Sebastian Rebolt from Merck Millipore to join us today to talk about manufacturing and flexibility. I don't know about the rest of you guys. First off, I'd like to, so Merck Millipore, so what is it? We're a filter company or, so can you, just give me that, some of that background. Uh, good question, good question. Uh, actually, I joined Millipore, the legacy Millipore, Merck Millipore in Europe, EMD Millipore in the US about 10 years ago. That was still a filter company. Many, many changes in the company now. Uh, really biotech, pharma oriented. Uh, so filters are still a big part of the offer, absolutely. On the top of that, you have the resins, you have the culture media, uh, you have the equipment, and uh, what many people don't know is that actually Milipa has a, a contract development and manufacturing organization, which, I, which I'm leading, based in, in France. Uh, so we have biotech activities, we're developing processes, we're pushing these processes into uh, clinical phase one, two, three. Uh, for external clients, so it's it's definitely not a filter company. I mean, we're working as the uh, as the big biotechs are uh, for patients to uh, develop and manufacture drugs. So that's not known. So from the filter to the biotech activities, there's been years, and I'm not sure everyone understands that change. But it, that was a pretty big change in the company. Yeah, I know that was something that uh, I've always scratched my head. So I'm glad we uh, touched on that a bit. So. Sebastian, I, I think the question we really wanted to talk about too was this the whole concept of versatility and flexibility. Uh, for a day and a half now, we've been talking about people who want to be able to move modules, people who want to be able to go from one process to another. So I think if we step back, what is your perception of, let's talk about versatility first you know, from a manufacturing standpoint. So versatility and flexibility for me is the ability to answer quickly to a new problem. Uh, back in 2011, uh, within the company, there was that vision that we could use the brand new single-use equipment uh, to bring in the manufacturing environment some flexibility. That was a vision. Was that true? That was the question. So at the, at the, at the Merck group level, uh, the decision was made to invest in a manufacturing site. That was part of the Merck Serono group and move that into Merck Midipore to create a contract development organization, put in place the single-use equipment, and look at how we could change the way we were manufacturing, moving from stainless steel to single-use. Was that bringing flexibility? That was the question. So actually, the goal was not to answer um, based on a paper exercise, but really, the goal was to answer based on real-life examples, which are developing and manufacturing for external clients using single use. How do we see today that we're flexible? Um, I think there's one very simple answer. If I have a customer coming today saying, could you make for me a phase one batch starting in uh, a week from now? Most of the time the answer is yes. Because in the past we had to uh, manage uh, spare parts for stainless steel. Um, revamping, sanitizing, all these activities were taking a lot of time. Now that we've moved to single use, starting a new run from scratch is just putting a bag in place on the bioreactor, plugging in on the controller, and we're ready to run. So we moved from a couple of weeks or even a month of preparation of a stainless steel suite to a couple of hours to half a day before we start to operate. So assuming that we have the raw materials in-house, the, 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 the big components, the bioreactors and, and the DSP equipment is ready to operate in a couple of hours. So that's the flexibility and, and the versatility. It's the ability to say, yes, I can find a solution to your problem in a couple of hours. So let me see if I had it. So it was pretty much you, you had a conventional facility with stainless yeah. steel tankage. Yeah. So you abandoned that, yeah? And then went to single use, was that? So our, our objective was to um, show that single use would be working, and in order to do that, we've kept part of the stainless steel. I mean, I like all these case studies where you just have single use. Fantastic. Right. But if you compare something to nothing, you always win. You always have the best because there's no comparison. So we've kept uh, 1,000 liters stainless steel bioreactors and the associated DSP equipment so that during a couple of years, 
we've been running single use and stainless steel in parallel and then really measuring the benefits of each system running in parallel. So we've, we've really started by implementing and validating the equipment and running the same molecules on both equipment to see where were the real savings and where the flexibility was really coming from. So we, we now have a hybrid facility where about 75% is single use. Still, we have 25% stainless steel, but to be honest, uh, 2015 and 2016, we have no project planned in, in stainless steel. That's only single use. One of the things I found interesting, you said we try to compare the two. Uh, we had a very detailed discussion the other day about biosimilars. And what I thought was important for our, our folks that were listening was that we made sure we understood that the difference between biogeneric and biosimilars. We got into this discussion of what is identical. So the question I have is if you run two processes side by side, how do you determine, what are you measuring to say it's the, they're, they're the same? Um, so depend what you want to look at. Um, obviously, we're looking at the uh, economics, we're looking at the flexibility, uh, but what's important? The quality of the molecule. Is the molecule identical when you run it in stainless steel and single use? Actually, we started with that. And we started by comparing, uh, at the process development scale, the, the historical three-liter glass bioreactor to the new three-liter single-use bioreactors. Then we've moved to the phase one type of scale, which is 200 liter, comparing that to 300 liter stainless steel, 200 liter single-use. Then we've moved to the larger scale, which is uh, uh, the 1,000 liter stainless steel, and we've aligned all the platforms to ensure that in, in terms of process, they would be comparable whatever the scale we're running. And we had a close look at the quality of the molecule. Uh, and when I'm saying quality of the molecule, it's deep enough so that this molecule, whatever the scale, could be tomorrow in a file uh, and would be registered, more or less. And we found that it was comparable, but that we were not addressing the same questions. When we talk about the stainless steel, there is a very long history on the quality of the process uh, that is not existing on the single use and, and specifically leachable and extractables, obviously. Are the leachable and extractable impacting the quality of the molecule? That was one of the questions. So we've made the process with water, with media, and finally the real process with uh, the culture media and the cells and so on. And we've sampled at each and every step to check that not only the final quality of the molecule was the same, but that the intermediates were staying the same as well. So we, ha we had a look at that. So when you look at the process, you, you need to have a, a holistic view. So economics, yes. Timing, absolutely. Investment, I mean, CapEx, uh, FTs. Uh, but I mean, number one, what is number one? Your ability to deliver a molecule with the proper uh, level of quality, obviously. So. Uh, let's touch on a couple of those topics. Uh, for example, you said extractable. So you actually processed it with, as you had noted, various media with the intent to determine extractables or what was the... Yeah, yeah, intent to uh, um, have a close look at uh, uh, leachables and extractables, both, and have a look at the impact of using plastics instead of stainless steel on, um, um, well, process quality attributes uh, and product uh, quality uh, attributes. Uh, clearly, we've seen that, yes, uh, the extractables are different when you look at uh, stainless steel versus plastic, that's obvious. Take glass. You have extractable from glass as well. I mean, it's an old story now, so no one's talking about that, but you have extractables coming from glass. I mean, that's obvious, but I mean, who's talking about that? No one. So we've just compared the various extractables and checked if there was a toxicity question. And where were we according to the ICH levels? We were three to five logs below. So is there an issue linked to leachable and extractable on this very specific process for this very specific molecule? And the other examples we've run after, the answer is no. So if you want to have a look at leachable and extractable after filing, you have an issue. If you look at leachable and extractable while you develop, you're going to bring the solution. So. What I'm hearing is if you got a BLA changing midstream is probably going to be more challenging than up front. Yeah, absolutely. And where do you see, I think, but I think that's really going to be, an, that's really where people want to go, right? I mean, what's your yeah. opinion? Yeah. You know, people want to go from the conventional to the single use, yeah? They do, they do. I think it's, a, it's more a question of anticipation, uh, managing the change and working on this question like leachable and extractable is going to be challenging in terms of timeline. If you anticipate 
and you work on the lead table and extract table question before you operate that change, so that in preparation you have discussion with the regulatory agencies, show the data, explain the rationale of the change, coming with the data showing we know that we can change because we are safe, now we're going to apply the change. That's a very different question than we're changing and in parallel we're working on the lead table and extract table. So it's, it's really about risk management and anticipation. I see that. And let me just let me just ask another question. Maybe out of it's being a, pro, a process guy from the small molecule side myself, I find that not every not everything is always available off the shelf uh, that I That's need. That's right. So for single use, how much of this is custom? Do you have to customize what you're going to buy? In other words, how much proactive? Granted, you could set up in a few days, but to have the the parts, how much of act, how much work is that? Um, it's a scale dependent question. Uh, if you look at the, what we call the medium scale, the 200 liter scale, more or less to 500 liter, most of the components are available or each supplier has customization tools that allow you in a limited number of weeks to get access to your specific consumable. When we are reaching the larger scale, uh, the 1,000, 2,000, uh, lead time be becomes more important and you need to prepare in that. And so if we're talking about uh, preparing clinical study phase one, phase two, you may find everything available pretty quickly. If we're talking about phase three or even commercial at 2,000 liter scale, and you have a customized process, there is an investment up, up front and that's really supply chain management. So what about on the versatility side? I mean, how many other, it's, we were gonna talk to someone who, you know, inherited a, a legacy process. So what upstream and what's, what, is there anything upstream or downstream from the reactor that we have to consider as far as changeover for single use that, I mean, is there another piece that we, I think people's focus on one area. What other areas should we be focusing on? Transfer, what else? Um, so transferring from, a, I'm gonna take a real example, transferring from a 1,250 liter stainless steel bioreactor into the scale up model of this one at 15,000 liter, when you've done that during years, becomes very easy. When you have to move from stainless steel to single use, this is one level of difficulty. But if uh, stainless steel was historically designed with the same type of uh, um, uh, size ratio, for example. Okay. That's not always the case with single use. And moving from one supplier to another, uh, these ratio may be different. So you have to align the platform first. So in terms of versatility, you will get the versatility and the flexibility if you invest up front in studying your new equipment. So you may lose some of the flexibility up front and you will benefit from that flexibility once you've made uh, the, the full implementation, clearly. If we're talking upstream, that's where I see most of the, the alignment to be made. We've not really faced any difficulty on the downstream side, Good. mainly on upstream aligning the platforms. What people don't take into account is what is actually feeding the upstream and downstream, that's buffer and media preparation. Because if you move away from stainless steel, you're moving away from these big thousands of liters stainless steel tanks where you prepare the media and the buffers and you're moving to single-use mixers, single-use tanks and in terms of logistics that's extremely different. We're not talking anymore of having a fixed buffer and media prep room and, and uh, hundreds of meters of pipe uh, in the building distributing media and buffer to the various suites. We're talking about centralizing the buffer and media preparation and then pushing the mixers to the suite where it will be used. So people have a different job. It's a different equipment. In terms of logistic, that's quite different. How many bags do you need to keep in inventory for how many buffers? How do you bring eight buffer at the same time in the same suite? In terms of logistic, it's a very different mindset and, and people tend to forget that. Well, I think one of the things I'm hearing, which is a very positive aspect, is you shrink the footprint of the process. Oh, you do? A lot. A lot by at least a factor of two, at least. That's excellent. Because one of the things that, again, was a point that uh, Craig Johnson from Walker Barry, we had some folks in talking about putting stuff in a box and then moving it about very, and one of the things was getting everything to fit in an 18 by 48 foot footprint. 
So what I'm hearing is, is that the single use seems to be right there. It seems to be something that you don't have to have an existing tank farm, but you know, this is uh, interesting. So what would be, for, all right, if somebody's gonna anticipate this, what would be the guidance? Uh, for example, you're gonna change over your plant, your facility, which is something you've did successfully. What was the first step you took? Uh, looking at the process. Many people look at the facility first and ask the question, what can we put into the facility? I think you, you should have a, a very different angle. Let's look at the processes, not the process. Uh, so I'm, I'm usually uh, recommending that you have a look in three steps. Uh, step one, what do you want to run tomorrow? And then we'll design upstream and downstream suites according to what you need to uh, run tomorrow and next year. Let's have a look at what you need to run in five years uh, and then in 10 years. Then we have a look at the facility, but let's answer these three separate questions first. Tomorrow, five years, 10 years. Uh, let me tell you why. If I'm looking at what I need tomorrow, it may be a couple of 200 liter bioreactor and a couple of 2000 liter bioreactor. That's tomorrow. The buffer and media prep area will be relatively small. If in five years from now, you need twice that capacity, you will need to fully revamp the plant because your buffer media prep area is too small because the, the corridors are too small, because you have no space to store some of the mixers where you prepare the media and so on. Uh, the DSP area may be too small because the size of the colony is going to increase. If you look at what you will do five years from now, you will solve the problems you'll have in five years today. And then you don't have problems anymore. So you need to anticipate based on the processes and based on the processes, you will design the plant. So unique approach most people look at the process and try to decide i mean they look at the facility and they say okay here's what i want to do i think that's a that's a good approach uh, i'm sure everybody's gone out on a due diligence to look at a facility that manufacturing has identified and they say okay can you make make the process work there well you should have asked about the process before you picked out the yeah. facility okay so in this particular case how you know, I guess maybe I always get hung up on this one. Is is at Merck Millipore, are you are you fully integrated? Do you do the do you make the dosage form as well at, at the facility? No, no, we don't. We don't. Right. Uh, we are going to the bulk drug substance. Then we have partnerships in place for the final fill and finish. Okay, so I mean, so the capability is really something which is something that somebody can, you know. What am I looking for? So people would come to you with something out of discovery or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some people come to us just to get the proof of concept. Uh, then we're making um, up to tox batches, more or less. So very small scale production, uh, which is very much aligned with the single use capabilities. Uh, we do have a customer, uh, for example, for whom we're making 40, 40 small scale production of 40 different variants of the molecule just for testing. So uh, when we can run 22 small-scale bioreactors single-use, and the setup time is half a day. So we're making the first campaign of 20 molecules. We're removing the bioreactor, replacing by another 20, and making the next 20. So in a, in a month, you have your, your 40 variants produced at the 5 gram scale, more or less. And then we're pushing to phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, we're not doing commercial manufacturing. So we stop after phase three, which is more or less 2,000 liter scale. Let's while we were talking about you know we talked about the footprint. Can you give us a sense? I mean, when we say footprint, are we talking twenty square meters, thirty square meters? What what is typically you know again think about it from a clinical you know you know small scale medium large. Give us a sense of the size we're talking. Uh, about. So the lab where we are running uh, process development, and I said up to twenty two bioreactors in parallel is is fairly small. We're talking two hundred and fifty square meter for upstream. Downstream, obviously, plus one 50-liter bioreactor that we're using for some tox batches. So it's not not very big. On the manufacturing side, uh, the 200-liter suite upstream is 60 square meter, and we have three 200-liter in there. So again, fairly small, and it's about 60 square meter as well for the DSP part. When we're talking 2,000-liter scale single use, it's a bit larger because we have. We, we plan to have two 2,000 liter bioreactor. We have one for now. Next one is for next year, most probably. Uh, that is about 100 square meters. Still, it's fairly small. 
And with the single use, just as a out of curiosity, is the, the utilities, support systems, these are skid-based systems? Facil yeah. yeah, skid based system. So utilities uh, compared to the old uh, stainless steel facility have really been downgraded. Uh, we're even looking into uh, options where we have basically no utilities except electricity and gas uh, for some small scale project where we, well, we even, we buy the media, the buffers and the water ready to use uh, uh, pre-packed in bags. So you just sterile connect uh, the bag to the bioreactor and fill with the media. So you don't even need an access to the water for some of the small and medium scale projects. You just buy the media ready to use. It's an interesting. So what is the business strategy for Merck Miller for then? Okay, you have this facility. So th your business strategy is, it's clear from that, but I mean, what, where do you perceive yourself being a player in the global market? You, with, you're looking at the biosimilars, you're looking at new, you know, new, new product. But give me a sense of what the vision is there. So the vision uh, for our activity was really to show that we can use single use to make product during phase one, two, three, and later during commercial manufacturing. And we, we don't have a, a typical contract development manufacturing organization business model. Our goal is to show that our products are working in this environment and that in the future, our customer will be using these products in routine manufacturing. So that's why we don't plan to be making routine manufacturing. We're just in a, let's say we're seeding the product, showing in real life uh, examples that this product can be used for clinical studies. And then in the future, our clients will internalize these products for their routine manufacturing. Uh, the plan is for us to help these customers develop their own facility. We tech transfer the process, including the equipment, train the people, help them with the first GMP runs. And when, when they are successful with the first GMP run, then we'll leave. If they need more support, they will call us, we'll come back and help them developing further their, their manufacturing facilities. So you do all the intellectual product, the pro property development, development, all that documentation, these are things that are provided as part of the service? So we can provide that as part of the service. We do the, obviously, um, we have to be compliant, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Uh, we provide also the regulatory support. Uh, the part that we're not doing directly to them, that we don't plan to be doing directly, uh, is the, the, the facility part, the engineering. Uh, we're, we're not an a &E company. We don't plan to be an a &E company. Uh, so we have partners for classical engineering or modular facility building, actually, some of them being here today, yeah. uh, who are doing the engineering part. We're designing the process, we're developing the process, we're manufacturing the drug substance for the clinical studies, we're helping our customers onboarding this process once it moves to uh, later uh, clinical stages or routine manufacturing, we're helping them designing the facility, an a &E partner of us can build that facility, okay. we train our customers and, and finally when everything's running in routine, we step back. So coming around again so it sounds I think what we've talked about is not only if you've, 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 you've wrestled versatility and flexibility to the ground to fulfill the business strategy of Merck really for in that case so but if you let's just say in a few in a couple of sentences you've obviously been successful change making the change from traditional to yeah. so what what's the short term long term what's the vision for yourself so short term, uh, we plan to expand the capacity uh, because we have more demand, obviously. Um, in parallel of that, being part of Merck Milipa and Merck, we have the ability to reach out to a number of R&D groups uh, with whom we collaborate and we're designing the next generations of these processes. So we're obviously working on uh, continuous processing. We spend a lot of time at uh, our facility in Bordeaux working on closed processes as well. So I think the short term will be really around working with our R&D groups internally, developing uh, the next generation that you will see in two to five years from now of equipment so that the single use manufacturing moves to the next step. Easier than today. Easier to implement, easier to validate. Even if today, I mean, versus single stainless steel, it's a, it's a no-brainer already. Right. But we can still move the needle and make better. 
and still on the short-term vision we can push the DSP the downstream part to the next level which is out of a 2,000 liter bioreactor purify 10 to 20 kilos of drug substance aligned with the productivity of the cell lines so that's short term long term we will really be playing a lot with this concept of fully integrated manufacturing in a ballroom facility or container type of facility with some systems where i'm sure automation will be a big part of that and some of the processes will clearly be fully closed and fully continuous and by fully integrated you mean through the dosage form yeah absolutely all right so i think we've talked about but sebastian i want to thank you very much we talked about our strategy long term short term it was enlightening for me and i'm kind of a newbie myself a little bit in that area so i appreciate that that takes care of that section of our ineffects live thank you very much thank you very much